From fishing to boating to swimming, Narragansett Bay is Rhode Island's oasis. Decades have been spent working to protect this precious resource from harmful pollution. But have those efforts gone too far? On this edition of Community Conversations, we examine the question, is the bay too clean? We'll hear from some who say their livelihoods are on the line, while others feel we should stay the course. Presented by Rhode Island Foundation and produced in association with Rhode Island Monthly. Hello, I'm Mario Florio. Welcome to this edition of Community Conversations. Narragansett Bay, is the bay too clean? It's probably not a question you'd think anyone would pose, but some who make their living off the water are wondering just that. Specifically, they're concerned about what's missing from the water and worried that a plan to make Narragansett Bay cleaner and the way it's being implemented is negatively impacting our most precious resource. Todd McLeish is a freelance writer and contributor to Rhode Island Monthly who focuses on environmental issues. He dove headfirst into this topic for the magazine and joins us now with more. Hi, Todd. Hi, Mario. Good to see you. What prompted you to explore this question, is the bay too clean? Because like I said, it almost sounds like it's counterintuitive. It does sound kind of strange. And I actually first heard about the subject uh, maybe four or five years ago. I was working for URI, and I was talking with a professor who was monitoring the health of the bay and um, trying to determine whether the state's wastewater treatment plants had reduced the amount of nitrogen they were discharging into the bay as was mandated by the state. Uh, and when I talked with her, she said that some fishermen were concerned that um, the water was getting indeed too clean. Uh, yes, the, the plants had indeed uh, met the targets, but the fishermen were concerned that, 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 they, that it had gone overboard. And so I thought that was interesting, but it was figured that was going to go away. Mm -hmm. And it was just this last winter when I heard about a, a symposium at URI, sponsored in part by URI and, and Rhode Island Sea Grant, where they examined this exact issue, brought together scientists and fishermen and others, uh, and spent a whole day talking about the subject. And clearly, the issue hasn't gone away. I thought it would be a great story to write for, for Rhode Island Monthly, and, and here we are. Yeah, and let's go back to a little bit of the history. This all stemmed from that massive fish kill from 2013, 2003 rather, um, in Greenwich Bay when a million Manhattan turned up dead. Uh, exactly. That, that was a, a big f force for the, for the changes at the, at the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, lots of things actually contributed to that um, fish kill, but most of them were sort of natural events. And the one thing that contributed that sort of was under the state's control was uh, this, uh, this issue of nitrogen being discharged from the wastewater treatment plants. As a result uh, of the fish kill and what scientists concluded about the cause, the state decided to try to limit the amount of nit nitrogen going into the bay. Uh, and that's the only thing they could control, so uh, that's what they did to reduce the, the, the nitrogen by about 50 percent. Um, and so the, the study by you or the URI researcher did indeed indicate that they met that target. Right. So the thinking was uh, one of the factors, contributing factors, was the nitrogen, um, too much of it in the water, and then there was a lack of oxygen in the water for the fish. C correct. Essentially when, I mean, nitrogen is a, is a fertilizer, essentially. It's in our grass fertilizers, and that's what makes the, the grass grow. Uh, and in the water, it uh, sort of sparks the growth of algae. Uh, phytoplankton, little tiny marine plants. And uh, that's a good thing we, when we have algae in the water because that's what a lot of uh, small fish eat. But too much of it uh, could indeed cause and does indeed cause these big algae blooms that sucks oxygen out of the water and causes other concerns. So, um, so that's sort of the balancing act, trying to figure out what, how much nitrogen is, is good to pr ensure we do have some uh, algae and food for the fish, uh, but not too much that's going to cause fish kills and other problems. Yeah. One of the fishermen you interviewed called Narragansett Bay Chernobyl. <laughs> what was your reaction to that analogy? It was a little bizarre to hear that. It sounded a bit like an overstatement, but, but um, I mean, because of course, Chernobyl, the, the nuclear plant that, that sort of caused this widespread dead zone around the plant, uh, and we all know that there's still lots of life in the bay, uh, and so that, that statement seemed to be a bit of an overstatement to me, but I also understood his point. And his point was that he was focusing more on these little tiny microscopic creatures uh, that from his perspective and from his observations seemed to be deficient, seemed to be a lot fewer than when he was able to catch lots of fish. Uh, the, the small creatures are the, are the base of the food chain. And when he was observing that there were 
so many fewer of them, that was a red flag for him. Um, Chernobyl might be a bit of an overstatement, but still, I understand his point, and, and it's a point well taken. Yeah, no life in the water. Correct. Yeah. So what have you found in terms of interviewing the, the fishermen you interviewed? They have had to move where they go to try to catch, make their catch. Well, well, certainly, and, and there's been a bit of a, um, I guess there's, there's lots of different fish that folk, folks are targeting. Certainly the, the guys that I've been speaking with especially who are concerned are lobster fishermen. Uh, we've seen a big drop in lobster populations in the bay, uh, and so that's been their main concern. Now most, most of the fishermen, the lobster fishermen that I spoke to are only fishing in the southern part of the bay, only fishing outside the bay because they're not finding as many lobsters. There might be other and probably are other issues uh, affecting the lobsters because that decline in lobster numbers seem to start before this whole drawdown of nitrogen, but clearly that's an issue that the fishermen are, are especially concerned with. So it's pushed them actually out of Narragansett Bay. Well, I'm not sure push them out, but certainly there is, there, there is a, uh, fewer lobsters in the bay than there are outside the bay Right. from their observations. Right. And in terms of the types of fish that are still in the bay, even though uh, creatures like lobsters, crabs seem to have decreased, uh, your research showed or your interviews showed that some other fish populations actually are on the rise? Well, that certainly seems to be the case. A long-term study by URI is showing certainly uh, considerable changes in the abundance of species in the bay and changes in the composition. So uh, a lot of the species that used to be found uh, at the bottom of the seafloor, crabs, lobsters, uh, winter flounder, for instance, that used to be abundant uh, are less so, but we're getting more and more fish in the bay that are um, living higher in the water column that, and uh, they're eating uh, things that are higher in the, in the water, uh, essentially limiting the amount of food that might be falling to the floor for those lobsters and crabs and other things to feed on. So from the scientists I've talked to, it seems as if we have a still an abundance of, of species in the bay, but a big change in that species composition. The cold water species, the bottom feeding species seem to have uh, declined, while the water column species and the warmer water species seem to be on the increase. Yeah, so it definitely seems like there are a lot of factors maybe that are playing into what these fishermen are seeing. And, and that's exactly what the, the, the challenge is for the scientists trying to explain and trying to uh, get a better understanding so that the, the fishermen will have a better sense of how they need to proceed is there are so many factors. And is it nitrogen? Is it climate? Is it um, all these other factors that could be contributing? Is it predators, increasing numbers of predators coming into the bay, eating little lobsters or smaller fish and so forth? Yeah. So again, Lots of issues, and it's a complex one to, to try to figure out. Yes, and we're going we're gonna to try to touch on all of it uh, during this conversation. All right, Todd, thank you so much. The fishermen you interviewed, by the way, have had decades of experience out on the water, correct? Th yeah. They have, and they've been you know, on the water in Narragansett Bay for 40, 45 years, uh, and so they clearly have some, uh, a lifetime's worth of observations, and certainly the scientists, and certainly I, don't want to discard their, their observations. They're the ones that really are on the water every day and, and uh, are sharing what they're, what they're seeing. The scientists are then trying to explain what's going on and, and trying to figure out then how to proceed with, with improving the situation. Great, and we wanted to see also firsthand what they're seeing in the water that's causing them a lot of concern. So we went out on the water with lobsterman Al Eagles. We want you to take a look and listen to what he has to say about the changing bay in his own words. Yeah, my name's Al Eagles. I'm from Newport, uh, Rhode Island. I'm a commercial lobster fisherman. I've been doing it continuously for 45 years now, but I started when I was 10, about 58 years ago. About four years ago, we saw a drastic change in the bay. There were changes taken uh, aggressively over time, small changes. They took a period of time to take place, like the disappearance of the kelp, and the disappearance of the rockweed. But four years ago, uh, it was actually what I call the uh, straw that broke the camel's back. The barnacle stopped growing on our lobster traps on the Newport Bridge going north what we call sea squirts and rosebuds, they all stopped, also stopped growing on the traps. And another thing that took place was the starfish in the bay disappeared. And there were millions of starfish in this bay, and all, overnight they just disappeared about four years ago. So we have grave concerns about the health of Narragansett Bay as a marine estuary. You know, there's a misconception going around that, you know, that we're saying that the bay is too clean, 
and other people saying that the bay can never be too clean. We're not looking from a, a point of view of not treating the affluent for fecal coliform. What we're saying is the bay's too clean, the water column is clear because there's less phytoplankton and less zooplankton in it. That's our perspective. You know, and that's the food chain, the basis of the food chain for the whole ocean. So we're not saying don't treat the affluent going into the bay from the wastewater treatment plants. There's another way of doing it. It's ultraviolet. It's very friendly for the marine environment rather than the chemicals that they're using. See, that's a big misconception I think that people have that we're saying that the bay's too clean and we don't want it cleaned up. That's not true. We want them to treat it, but you can treat it with UV. And you can see clear through the water column in July and August. You can see down through the water column 15 to 20 feet. That means there's no life in it. It's supposed to be discolored. The discoloration is vital plankton and zooplankton. That's the issue we have. We want you to treat the effluent going into the bay, but do it in an environmentally friendly manner, such as UV. You know, Narragansett Bay is a very important estuary. U.S. Congress voted to make Narragansett Bay an estuary of national significance. And that's very important to me. I've been fishing on the bay all my life here. If the whole U.S. Congress feels that this bay is that important, I feel we should do something about it to preserve it. Well, that's my take. And joining us now are local fisherman Al Eagles, who you just saw in that piece, and Lanny Dellinger, along with Rhode Island Monthly contributor Todd McLeish, who's back with us as well on the panel. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, Al, I'll start with you. Um, you talked about the fact that you don't like the question, is the bay too clean? Because it's, you're not really saying that you don't want it to be clean. You're concerned about the quality of the water, the quality of what's happening in the bay, almost maybe too sterile. Is that a better phrase? Well, first of all, thank you for having us here today, Mal. We appreciate it. You get to spread the word with our ideas about the bay. Yeah, what we're saying is uh, the water column in uh, June and July and August in the bay uh, used to be brownish color, but it was full of vital plankton and zooplankton. You know, you could scoop up a bucket of water and you could see, you know, minuscule animals, the larvae of different fish and lobsters, crabs, swimming in that bucket. In the last four years, we scoop up a bucket of water in the bay, we don't see any life in it whatsoever. It's just clear water. It's like a swimming pool. You know, when you treat a swimming pool with chemicals, you can see right to the bottom. Well, now in Narragansett Bay, you can see 15, 20 feet in the water column. And for us, we don't feel that's a healthy bay. It's not a healthy marine ecosystem. We want to see the vital plankton and the zooplankton in the bay. So we're not saying, like I said in the film there, we're not saying don't treat the affluent going into Narragansett Bay, but treat it in an environmental friendly manner. And we think that should be ultraviolet. There's uh, not over 9,000 municipalities in the United States using ultraviolet today. And over 49% of the wastewater treatment plants in North America use UV. The re there's a reason they're all doing it. They're all getting away from chemicals. And chemicals have been outlawed in Europe for years now. They use UV for everything over there. Their swimming pools, their, uh, their water parks and everything. So the message we're trying to get out, we know that there's, there's organizations that are doing a, a great job. Save the Bay is one of them. They're trying to clean up the bay. But we're saying we want a healthy marine estuary. You can still clean up the bay, remove the fecal coal from, but do in a healthy environmental fashion, as such as UV. Yeah, Lanny, we heard um, Al in the piece talk about what he's experienced over his 45 years. 45 years fishing out of Newport. And you, you have a similar history, right? You've been fishing since you were a kid? Yeah, I've been fishing since I was a kid. Uh, Al's got me beat probably by a good <laughs> 10 or 15 years. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that he said. Um, you know, I, I have watched the the same things happen over time with Narragansett Bay, and um, you know, we started talking about four years ago, four or five years ago, um, trying to put our finger on, you know, what 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 is going on? What's happened to the bay? You know, we've seen the disappearance of rockweed, and especially in the mid to lower bay, uh, the kelp, uh, you know, all of that stuff is um, healthy habitat, you know, for fish, lobsters, a whole host of different critters. Um, I started as a core hogger, and uh, you know, back in the day, we had thousand core hoggers, and shell fishermen could work from. It was full-time core hoggers working out of Dutch Harbor, um, which is you know down halfway down um, Jamestown on the West Passage, and they worked. There was hundreds of guys that worked south of Patience Island and Prudence Island, all the way up through the Upper Bay. There was four or five different buy boats. There was actually catering boats that would cook. Um, you know, burgers and whatnot for the guys out on the water during the day. Because there was enough people out yeah, there. Yeah, there was enough. There was enough shellfish, and you know, people were spread out those places where you could make a living. And it seems like you know, 
as I look back now, and if you take a ride up in the bay, I don't see any of that anymore. The shell fishermen are constrained to pretty much in the northern, very most northern parts of the bay. That whole fishery that took place in the southern part of the bay is gone. And, um, you know, a lot of talk about climate change, and nobody d denies that the climate change, and I think we all realize that. But that doesn't, uh, it's not the answer for a lot of the observations that we feel that we're seeing. Um, mercenary, mercenary quahogs grow quite wonderful in Florida. Um, so it's a lot warmer there, their waters, than there is here. Um, you know, same thing with like eelgrass and things of that nature. There was a study done by the University of Rhode Island that just came out last year uh, where they, you know, looked at eelgrass populations and we watched a, like a 19% decrease along Jamestown, mm -hmm. yet you look over to the Narrow River, they had a 45% increase. What's the difference? I don't think there's any wastewater treatment plants contributing anything to the Narrow River and they haven't gone through this nitrogen reduction program that the state instituted here back in well, 2004, 2005. Right. So I question if that isn't, you know, a lot of what's driving um, the observations that we've been witnessing over the years. So how has it impacted you? You don't even go I don't in fish bay? in the bay anymore. Um, I used to fish up there early, um, you know, and then fish outside during the summer months, then come back in the fall. And, and uh, as a lobster fisherman, I mean, I quahogged up there for years, um, but not, not able to do that. And that's happened with so many of the, my friends. I've watched hundreds of people, you know, hundreds of people lose their jobs, uh, going out of business, the infrastructure go out of business. And a few guys that are still fishing um, have had to move their operations from where they used to primarily just fish in the bay. Well, now they're fishing out front um, where I fish. Um, so. How does that impact when um, you're, they have to go farther out and, and further away to, to be well, able to make a living. Well, increases overhead time, time on, you know, on your vessel, on the boat, and of course, um, it's like anything else. Uh, use the pizza analogy, you know? If you've got a bunch of pizzas, everybody eats well, but if you only got one pizza and everybody's coming in to, to try to, you know, live off of the, uh, off the pizza, everybody eats <coughs> a whole lot less. So. Al, you were the one that made the uh, comment about Chernobyl. I saw in a few different articles because, of course, you say that they're gonna, you're going to get quoted on that. Yeah, yeah that's but, correct. Uh, yeah. You well, the reference is that <coughs> a, a friend of mine. And we were talking about it. And, uh, one of the fishermen that's actually here in the audience who agrees with everything we say. He fished in the bay his whole life, Denny Ingram, and uh, he started telling me, you know, four or five years ago that the lobster population in the upper bay was disappearing. Well, we were still seeing it in the lower bay, so we weren't too concerned, but. Eventually, it caught up with us a few years ago, so we started calling the Upper Bay Chernobyl because mm. it's just it's a vast wasteland from, from our perspective, from a lobster fisherman's perspective. So that's where that term came from. It, it's a sad thing to have to say, but that's how we feel about it, to be actually you know, mm. true about it. Now, Todd, I know in your uh, interviews with some of the other uh, people in your article, uh, there are other factors that they attribute the decline in the lobster population to as well, right? Well, that's right. They, they say that the lobster population began to decline before this nitrogen um, drawdown, uh, and that they, they say that um, certainly that warming water seems to be a, a factor as well. Apparently, juvenile lobsters or, or, or larval lobsters uh, prefer to grow at a, at a, in a particular temperature water, and as our waters have gotten warmer, uh, they're not producing as much or not growing as well. Uh, and so that seems to be one factor that the scientists are pointing to. Um, increased numbers of predators, other fish that are coming into the bay uh, that might be uh, feeding on uh, these young lobsters might be also a contributing factor as well. But again, all this complexity of different issues um, com coming together at the same time certainly makes it difficult to uh, figure out exactly what's, ha what's happening. Yeah, perfect storm, I guess, huh, if you want to look at it that way. Well, and I, and I just want to make the point that this isn't just about lobsters. I mean, there's a whole host of different things, I say, that don't fit the analogy about the water temperature, mm -hmm. you know, the quahogs being one of them, um, you know, and there's many others. Um, that you, you just can't say temperature is the is the driver for everything. I mean, granted, we know that we have climate change to deal with, but there's other things that are driving um, some of the observations that we're seeing. Um, I mean, we don't even have barnacles growing in the bay, in the lower part of the bay anymore. I mean, you talk to most of the people that um, work at shipyards or have been around it for any amount of time, boats are coming out of the water, they're not even dirty compared to, you know, the way they, the way they used to be. Um, you know, even at my own boat, I can look down at the bottom and, uh, you know, it's like a swimming pool. It's crystal clear. I mean, there's nothing growing with, you know, 
10 or 15 years ago. You didn't see that. You looked down and there was all kinds of weed and barnacles and whatnot growing, and uh, you know that that's that's going out the window. Yeah, you called it. Oh, go ahead, Al. Yeah, to that point, I just want to say that uh, in the bay north of the Newport Bridge, uh, like I said, with the straw that broke the camel's back yeah. was about four years ago. But the barnacle stopped growing on our traps. We also have these other marine life, like we call them sea squirts and rosebuds. And they all disappeared in, in the bay, too. The bridge north, basically. And the starfish disappeared. There used to be millions of starfish in Narragansett Bay, and they disappeared almost overnight. And, you know, there was rumors around it was, could have been a disease. Well, we don't know what happened, but everything seemed, seemed to take place at the same time. But yet, on the other hand, when you get on the mouth of the bay or in the open ocean on Rhode Island Sound, the barnacles still grow on the traps. I mean, just like they always did. And we still have the uh, sea squirts and the rosebuds. Uh, and there's plenty of lobsters out front. I mean, I do research for different organizations, and we do ventless lobster traps. And it's, we did one just yesterday, and there were, uh, you know, over 60 animals in one ventless lobster trap. But that was at the mouth of the bay. If you go north of the bridge, you're lucky if you see a, a few lobsters in a ventless trap. We just did a study for the state last week, and in the upper bay, uh, we didn't see, we all three different stations up there, we didn't even see one lobster in the ventless traps up there, which is, really? you know, that's an eye-opener. But yet down the mouth of the bay, I did when we had 60 animals or 60 lobsters in it, and most of them were all sublegal. So there's a big disconnect between the bay, north of the bridge, the upper bay, and mm -hmm. the lower bay and the ocean. And we don't know exactly what it is, so we just have to surmise. But So what we're trying to give uh, our observations and let maybe somebody else can figure out what the problem is. But personally, we do think that the uh, wastewater, the way they're treating the wastewater and uh, the reduction in nitrogen have an effect on it. But that's our personal opinions. We don't know that for a fact, but there is definitely a big disconnect between the bay and the open ocean. And it's, I don't think it's water temperature because the temperature doesn't change very much between Newport Bridge and Castle Hill. Mm -hmm. So that's our perspective. And, and I just want to add, I mean, it's not just the science, it's not just the fishing community that feels, but there's, there's actually some people from the science community that felt the same way. I mean, Scott Nixon uh, warned, uh, I'll, I'll use the word warned, that there was a the potential to be the you know demise of wild caught fisheries in Narragansett Bay um, by reducing nitrogen to the levels that they have. He called it the grand experiment. The grand experiment. They weren't sure exactly. what was going to happen, right? Right. They didn't know what was going to happen. And, um, you know, I've heard, like at the Beard Symposium, there's a lot of talk about, oh, the biomass of fish is the same in Narragansett Bay as it has always been. And that's just simply not true. Um, we used to have so many menhaden in Narragansett Bay, and, you know, they. That data is derived by the DM Troll Survey or the URI tr Troll Survey, which they do monthly. Um, they don't catch menhaden. I can personally tell you that back in the 80s, uh, you could look from Wickford Harbor on a flat day um, all the way across Narragansett Bay, and there were so many schools in Manhattan. We had reduction boats. There was tons and tons of unbelievable amounts of Manhattan in Narragansett Bay. Well, if those were added to those numbers, you would surely see the huge reduction in the biomass. And the fish that do come into Narragansett Bay are not our resident fish. They're migratory fish. They show up in the summer. Um, and they leave in the fall. All of our native species, you know, your flounders, your blackfish, um, you know, stuff that we traditionally lived here year round is not doing very well. Um, it doesn't matter if it's quahogs or scallops or lobsters, crabs, flounder, all of them, um, the numbers are way down. And that doesn't bode well for you. No, no. And, people and make it, a living on right, it. Right, and it. And it, it it, it scares me that we're going to lose our fishing heritage. Narragansett Bay always had a strong fishing community on it, and I've watched probably hundreds of my own friends. I've watched the infrastructure decline. I mean, there's not even a fish house left in Newport anymore. Um, and it's the same thing all around Narragansett Bay. Everywhere you look, um, the infrastructure is just is shrinking. And, the, you know, like I said, there was probably a 1,000 shell fishermen at one time. That was millions of dollars, lots of lost economic revenue. Um, you know, and they, you know, the, the scientists knew when they were going to reduce nitrogen by 50 percent, that was going to reduce primary production by 30 percent. We've got federal laws in place um, that say we have to achieve maximum sustainable yield on all these species for the good of the people. Yet here in the state of Rhode Island, we're doing things to directly stop that from happening. We reduced primary redu uh, production by 30 percent. Mm. Yeah, I just like to. I'm going to go back to what I say about. <clears throat> our observations of what the changes we've seen take place in the mm -hmm. bay. 
Uh, two of the other big changes we've seen is um, the absence of kelp and rockweed okay. growing in the bay. Mm -hmm. Years ago, uh, the kelp and uh, we used to haul our lobster trawls down in the mouth of the bay, and the kelp would be, we'd have balls the size of pickup trucks on it. It's hard to find a strand of kelp in Narragansett Bay anymore. And rockweed used to be, used to cover the shorelines all around Jamestown and everything. And we just steamed up Jamestown the other day and did observation there. And the whole east side of Jamestown, we didn't see any rockweed whatsoever. We didn't see any until we got down to Taylor's Point just by the Newport Bridge. There was very little growing there. So that's all habitat for fish and lobsters and crabs. So we've lost that also. So those are our observations, negative changes we've seen in the bay. You know, we don't know exactly what's causing it all, but the, we, we really don't think it's climate change or water temperature. There's more to it than meets the eye here. So that's what we'd like to get to the bottom of it. And maybe if we all work together, we can solve the problem and restore Narragansett Bay as a healthy marine ecosystem. All right, and that's, that's a great note to end this segment on. I know, gentlemen, that uh, no one's arguing we don't want to see a clean, healthy Narragansett Bay, obviously. Absolutely. Your main concerns are how it's being done. And in just a few minutes, we are going to hear from the agency that is responsible for water quality in the bay and learn more about some of the science and nature that may be behind the changes that these fishermen have experienced. But first, the organization that for nearly half a century has been working tirelessly to protect and improve Narragansett Bay. We're going to take you back out on the water now with Save the Bay. My name is Mike Jarbo. I'm the Narragansett Bay Keeper at Save the Bay. First of all, no, we don't think the water is too clean. We think it's far from that. Um, the bay is something that changes every day. It changes on a yearly level. It's been changing since it was basically made during the glacial age. As the glaciers retreated, Narragansett Bay was formed. Ever since then, the bay has been changing. Uh, it's gone through iterations where it's been so dirty in this area, you wouldn't want to touch the water. Today, it's not that dirty. We, st we still have issues up here. Um, you look around us, we see a dozen, two dozen fishermen up here. You know, they're chasing the striped bass that chase the menhaden, that chase all the nutrients that are still in the bay. If the bay was completely sterile, there'd be no fish in the bay at all. That, we're not seeing that at all. We've seen the bay actually uh, coming back to life probably over the last 10, 20 years is uh, some really big improvements have been made in the water quality in Narragansett Bay. Again, there are, there are so many complex factors that come into play when we're talking about what's happening in Narragansett Bay. I'd be crazy to question the observations that fishermen who have been on the water for 30, 40 years make. I think they're making very valid observations. Things are changing in the bay. However, I don't necessarily agree with the reason. You know, one of their theories is that the uh, effluent from wastewater treatment plants, such as the one behind us, is sterilizing the bay due to the chemicals. Maybe there are ways that the, uh, the Bay Commission and other treatment facilities can improve their processes to uh, become more environmentally friendly. I think they've been doing that for decades now, trying to improve their processes since this plant basically, you know, when it was built, we just dumped sewage right into the bay and called it treated. Today, there are some very complex, technologically advanced processes that go into play. Are there better ways to do it? Maybe. But I think, you know, overall, we're doing a pretty good job. We're seeing a lot of things come back in the bay. We're seeing nutrient levels reduced significantly from where they were 30, 40 years ago um, to levels that haven't been seen in any of our lifetimes. And I can't claim to be an expert on the UV versus uh, chlorination for the um, final disinfection. I have seen some of the articles that uh, members of the fishing community and others have put forward. To me, I, I would venture to guess that, yeah, UV might be, is the future probably. Um, I, I think it's absolutely worth looking at. You know, if, if there are ways we can improve the quality of the effluent coming back into the bay and whatever other impacts that'll have, I, we're all for it at Save the Bay. And I, I really applaud anyone who's concerned about conditions in the bay to bring it forward. You know, there's always something we can do better. Here at the head of the Providence River, we, we're at the confluence of the Seekonk Rivers, the Blackstone, the Wenasquatucket. Um, so what we're seeing here, we get a lot of freshwater influx. So the salinity is going to be lower here. Temperatures are going to be different based on the amount of rainwater we're getting. Water clarity will be different. The type of habitat and the type of species you'll see up here tend to be different. As we make our way down the bay, we're going to have different interactions. We're going to have higher salinity levels as we get closer to the ocean. Uh, that's you know, what we call Narragansett Bay an estuary. It's at the confluence of a freshwater and saltwater system, which makes it a highly productive habitat and is one of the reasons that Narragansett Bay is so valued and so special. Well, I, you know, I think what you've got is you've got commercial fishermen that, you know, you grew up targeting a certain species. And like I mentioned, we're seeing a lot of different changes in the bay. We've seen about a three degree Fahrenheit change in water temperature in the bay over the last 50, 60 years. Just those three degrees make a significant impact on the, the climate for the fish. So what we're seeing is lobster, which are a, tr are a cold water species. They're almost being, uh, you know, the water's warmed enough that lobster are starting to make their way further north. 
My name is Jamie Sammons and I'm the Public Affairs Manager for the Narragansett Bay Commission. So the agency as a whole provides sewage collection and treatment to all or parts of 10 cities and towns in the metropolitan Providence and Blackstone Valley area. Everything that we do here at the wastewater treatment facility is driven by the Federal Clean Water Act of 1972, which established that all the navigable waters of the United States should be fishable and swimmable. And the way that we translate those goals in Rhode Island is through the regulation of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. So the way the Narragansett Bay Commission and the way all of the other wastewater treatment agencies in the state operate our facilities is in line with the requirements and regulations that are set up by the Rhode Island DEM, which ultimately are to make a cleaner, healthier, safer bay and clean and safe rivers. At the same time, however, there are issues of climate change that are bigger than what we do here at the wastewater treatment facility, and those are going to affect the life in the bay. I'm John Motter. I'm the Environmental Monitoring Manager at the Narragansett Bay Commission. And we're out here at Bullock's Reach. We're tied up to our Bullock's Reach buoy. And uh, this was started in, back in 2001 with federal uh, grant monies under the MPAC program. The NBC now owns and operates and maintains this buoy. We also maintain another fixed site up in the Seekonk River. Sarah is going to uh, show you the, the uh, sand. We can pull up a sand. And that's simply a device that has a lot of probes in it. It collects a lot of monitoring data, like uh, temperature, pH, chlorophyll, um, turbidity, depth, measurements. The water is cleaner than it's been in over 100 years. Um, as far as the data is showing us, it's, it's showing a very healthy environment right now. We're getting improved uh, dissolved oxygen to support the, the marine life in the bay. Uh, there's, there's plenty of chlorophyll and plankton uh, for food for the, for the fish. And we, we now have RIPTES permits that require us to remove nitrogen. And some people argue well, that that's the food necessary for the, for the phytoplankton that the fish will feed on. And what the proper level is, that, that's up for researchers to determine. But that's why we're collecting data here so researchers can use this data and, and figure it all out. Our facility at Fields Point uses chlorination, but we also dechlorinate with sodium bisulfite. So we need to kill the, the pathogens that are discharging from, from the facility. We do that with the chlorine, but then the sodium bisulfite will uh, kill the chlorine. So there's, and we have very, very strict limitations on what we can discharge as far as chlorine residual, and it's extremely low. It's extremely low. So um, we're really not we're, not, we're not impacting the bay with chlorine. And joining us now on our panel are Jonathan Stone, Executive Director of Save the Bay, and Tom Yuva, Director of Environmental Science and Compliance at the Narragansett Bay Commission, as well as Candice Oviet, Professor of Oceanography at the URI Graduate School of Oceanography. They'll be rounding out our discussion with our previous panel members still with us, Todd McLeish, Al Eagles, and Lanny Dellinger. Thank you all for joining us. The gang's all here. It's our pleasure, Mario. Uh, Jonathan, we'll start with you. Um, the whole conversation is centered around the word clean, and obviously everyone agrees they want a clean, healthy bay, but I think it's coming from different perspectives on what exactly is a healthy clean and what that means. How do you reconcile the goals of Save the Bay with some of the concerns that these fishermen have expressed? Well, I think, first of all, I would just say thanks for including us in the panel. And uh, we think uh, Lanny and Al's observations are accurate, and they are what they are. These guys have been on the water for their entire careers, and uh, we appreciate and respect their perspective on changes in the Bay. I think that's, uh, I think we all can agree with the importance of their observations. You know, we always think of the Bay uh, in terms of, um, th to the question of what the goals are for the efforts to restore Narragansett Bay, really around the question of health. And health, um, we use the swimming pool analogy too. A swimming pool is sterile. Nobody wants to see a sterile Bay. That's not our goal. That's not the goal of anyone around the, the room here. The goal of, the, uh, of, uh, of our organization is a Bay that is thriving, alive, with abundant sea life, 
uh, with fish, crabs, birds, marine mammals, all the organisms that characterize a healthy bay. That includes habitats like eelgrass, salt marshes, uh, running rivers. These are all things that, that we think constitute a healthy bay. Clearly, uh, one measure of health is risk to humans, and that's where the pathogens and the, and the risk of um, um, uh, harmful bacteria comes into play. And the wastewater treatment plant operators are bound to resolve, uh, to eliminate that problem. Another measure of health is the amount of oxygen in the water, and that's profoundly affected by how many nutrients come into the water, into the system, and how much um, um, algae uh, propagates, grows in the bay. So these are just two dimensions of how we think about the health of the bay. It's really a complex system. So it's important to consider many of these different dimensions. And for the, from a management point of view, how do we, how do we improve health uh, along these many different dimensions? Yeah. Candace, uh, you talk about the fact that the bay is a complex system. Uh, let's go back to the 2003 fish kill and talk a little bit about the science of what exactly happened there and what the uh, response was in terms of trying to remedy that. The, uh, the kill happened in <coughs> Greenwich Bay. And Greenwich Bay, uh, it's, it's a small embayment, but the, the tides don't flush it when there's a southwest wind blowing, which is typical of the su summer afternoons. So that holds the water in the Greenwich Bay area. And so some menhaden and crabs and a lot of other fish species and benthic species got caught in there when that water got held in there during a hot summer time period and there was a lot of mortality. Um, that's not actually why I think that the uh, rules were implemented uh, to reduce the nitrogen in the bay. The, uh, that started, I think, that whole process started for it was before it was part of the Clean Water Act, I believe, uh, and finally the Rhode Island DEM was getting into the act to do something about reducing the nutrient inputs to the bay. But certainly it gave the public huge impetus uh, to do something about the low oxygen conditions in the bay. Mm. So as a result, Tom, the goal was to reduce the amount of nitrogen being reduced, the being uh, emitted. Yes, as a result of the 2003 fish kill in Greenwich Bay, there was a governor's commission and a legislative commission that investigated uh, the situation and, and uh, the mortality of the fish and uh, many types of species of fish, Manhattan primarily, but a lot of different types of fish, millions of fish. And uh, the governor's re uh, report, the legislature actually issued legislation to mandate DEM to issue permits that had a that mandated a 50% reduction in nutrient discharges from wastewater treatment plants. And most of those dis discharge reductions occurred in the upper bay, which was most impaired for dissolved oxygen and uh, also most impaired for these blooms that were occurring. At the Narragansett Bay Commission, we've reduced our nitrogen load by 80 percent since 2003 and by about 60 plus percent from 1995, the year of the baseline year that DEM uses to gauge these reductions. Uh, so we've seen a great reduction. We've seen an improvement in water clarity, significant improvement. The water in the upper bay hasn't been this clear in uh, Candace's uh, study and different studies at URI, maybe 150 years in the upper bay. It's, uh, it's on caliber to the lower bay now as far as water clarity. So I, I asked uh, our science team to go back and look and look at the historical record to, to try to determine how does this compare? How many years did we turn the clock back? Was it 150 years like the clarity? And we did some back of the envelope calculations. And basically, uh, two different studies. One looked at the Blackstone River, basically uh, using Scott Nixon's reports and formulas. And uh, it, that looked like it, it turned the nutrient loading back to the 1890s, 1885 to 1895. And uh, we also looked at baywide loadings using Scott Nixon's report and the status and trends data and also Narragansett Bay Commission nitrogen loading data. And it looks like it's 1890. Mm -hmm. So I'm encouraging the university and the DEM to take that data, look at it, and see how far back we set the clock back on this. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, as, as we sewered Narragansett Bay, to give you a little history, 
In 1870, we started building a sewer system in Providence mm -hmm. that consisted of 65 pipes that connected to the rivers. And all of the horse manure from the streets, everything went into the rivers. Pipes from buildings went directly into the rivers. People were getting sick with cholera and typhoid, and hundreds of people were dying in Providence uh, through these various epidemics. So they started to add chlorine bleach. They actually built a treatment plant in 1901, and they started to add bleach to that plant in 1912. And we added bleach, just bleach, didn't take the bleach out, and I'm sure it wasn't controlled very well, the amount of bleach that they were adding. And that continued until 1998, and that's when we started adding sodium bisulfite, as John Motter indicated in the video. And at that point, we started taking the, the chlorine out and breaking it down to the harmless components of chlorides, which are in seawater, and sulfates, which are in seawater. What's your response to their concern about the chemicals? Now? I share their concerns. I don't share their concerns about the chemicals. I'm not going to say that something else isn't going on. There's definitely something going on. But these, there's three types of limits that are established by the, by the DEM. They, they establish limits based on based the best available technology. What's the technology that a treatment plant can achieve? They base it on water quality standards, what's in the water, and they base it upon the toxicity of the effluent. And we sample for all of those, and, and we don't have a problem with toxicity. What is that toxicity testing? Well, they take shrimp and they take fish and they put it right in our effluent. And they have to live, and we do that four times a year from both treatment plants. So the, that testing is done, but I'm not going to say something isn't going on. Something is definitely going on, and we're all in agreement, I think, and on this panel that we need to understand it better. And we do know the bay is changing dramatically, and that fishery has changed dramatically over those 150 years that I've referenced. Mm -hmm. you, there are fishermen who say they do smell chlorine, though. Is that correct? I, I can't address to that. I, I've never smelled it, to be okay. honest with you. I mean, I've heard that comment made by people, but I don't know what they're referring mm -hmm. to. Yeah. I, I've heard it years ago, uh, you know, guys that fished around Bishop's Rock and different way outfall pipes where they, they uh, you know, they, they mm. swear they could smell yeah. chlorine. But Todd, you yeah. interviewed some who said I, they I did. did. I interviewed a scientist at URI who's a, a chemical oceanographer who mm. uh, has been studying um, chlorine-related issues, in, in, in fact, in, in the Bay. And, um, uh, and, and he said that, indeed, uh, he's heard reports from a number of fishermen that they tend to smell a chlorine smell, and they were concerned that that was coming from the wastewater plants. But uh, the scientist, uh, Art Spivak is his name, and he, he suggested that uh, there actually is a, uh, an, an odor that comes from uh, algae blooms uh, that uh, smells a little bit like uh, a chlorine smell. So perhaps that's the explanation, mm -hmm. although he couldn't pinpoint that exactly. Yeah. Now, Al, I know you said that uh, there are places around the country that have success with the UV treatment and you feel that's the way we should go, right? Well, yeah, some of the research I've done, it, uh, back about a year or so ago, there's over 9,000 municipalities in the United States right now that are using UV treatment for the wastewater treatment facilities. And 49% uh, of the wastewater treatment facilities in, the, in North America use UV. And when you look at uh, outside the nation, you go to Europe, you know, the chemicals used for the wastewater treatment plants were outlawed years ago. They use all UV. And the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world is in Moscow. And I think they handle like 100 times millions of gallons a day that the rate is for Fields Point, and they use UV. So there's a lot of people investing a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy to convert into UV. And the main theme, everything you read about it, is it's because it's environmentally safe, the process that they use. And when you look at it, uh, and I, I did some research on it, it's, it, it's not only, it's, it's more expensive initially for the retrofit, but in the long run it's cheaper because you're not buying the chemicals, and you're not storing them, and you're not paying the high insurance costs to handle them because they're toxic when you handle them. Mm -hmm. and, you, uh, and it's more environmentally friendly. So from our perspective, for me it's almost like uh, just common sense. No brainer. Well, yeah, have no we looked brainer. at that? Yes, the Narragansett Bay Commission started looking at UV in 1995, and as a result of that, we transferred our Buckland Point plant from chlorine bleach to UV. And uh, there are many things that can affect the operation of UV. One of them is high flow rates. A combined sewer system is another thing. When you have heavy flows and, uh, and this mixed waste comes in uh, very quickly, like when we get rainfalls, that wastewater goes to our treatment plant. 
And uh, just at our Buckland Point plant alone, we were, we were fine two years ago because the UV system failed. You know, it's powered by electricity, and if the electricity fails and the generators don't start up, you result in a failure and you're in violation. And we actually had to close down shell fishing in the bay for a week because of that incident mm -hmm. and pay a big fine. So UV is, is more risk involved with it. I'm not disputing that it's, it it's can't be used, but uh, you also have size constraints. And at Fields Point, we're very much size constrained. So we don't have the area to build, build large building large enough to, to hold the UV lighting. Mm -hmm. So there are some other things that go along with that. You're right about the capital cost. It costs about five times more to install the UV, but the operating cost is a lot more. It's about $58 per million gallons to treat versus $38, gallon, $38 per million gallons to treat with chlorine. So there is a, there is a cost uh, benefit there also. Lanny, I want to ask you, because when we played the piece with the um, Narragansett Bay Commission, they showed those video of some of those um, different fish that were in there, and you kind of looked at it and mm -hmm. said, what was your response to it? You guys are saying you do see light. We're seeing a lot of changes in the upper bay, yeah. Yeah, and we do these videos because we want, to, we want to track, we want to be regulated based on sound science, mm -hmm. and not just some number in a water that people think then we should meet this number without science stu and studies to back it up. So our board has been, uh, has been awesome at supporting our, our science work to understand what's going on in the upper bay. And we do these videos, and we're seeing a lot of different types of sea life there. And even just recently, you know, Al was talking about kelp not being anywhere in the bay, and we spotted some kelp in the upper bay. So I'm hoping we're going to see some seagrasses coming, some kelp coming in the future. As we clean up the bay, the water is a lot clearer, sunlight can penetrate into, into this benthic region where we can uh, support uh, subaquatic vegetation, and that's what we're hoping to achieve in, uh, as we track this. But believe me, we're the first ones that will fight with DEM if we don't think a limit is appropriate. And we're very concerned about the nutrient reduction uh, without having the sound science behind it. And that's why we're doing these studies. You know, I mean, I see the video and it, to me, it, it just it, it acknowledges exactly what I've been thinking in my, in, in my simple mind, of th the way I look at things. But um, there's plenty of nitrogen in the upper bay, or well, maybe not plenty, but enough to sustain some fisheries Obviously, that's where all the coal hoggers have to go to work now. The problem is, is that that nitrogen was the supply for the whole bay. Well, now it's the mid and lower bay that are starving. Um, even uh, some of the science that presented at the, the Baird Symposium said even back in the 1950s, the mid to lower bay was always um, borderline um, with food, you know, with uh, having enough nitrogen to, to, to supply in the area for um, you know, the secondary production that we're concerned about, you know, your fish and core hogs and lobsters and, and things. Um, so, I mean, again, when you look at the lower bay and we see no rockweed, no kelp, um, you know, big reduction in Menhaden. Like I say, I've heard so many things about how the same, we have the same amount of fish as we always do. Well, that's, that's sim simply not the case. If you look back into the 70s and 80s, Narragansett Bay was full of Menhaden. Um, there was more Menhaden by pound, I would say, than every other fish combined back in those days. Now the only place you, every single striper fisherman is going to leave no matter where he is in Narragansett Bay, they got to drive all the way up to the Providence River to go find a pogey, to go snag them. That's why you see a few fishermen up there. That's why you see some shell fishermen up there, because the nitrogen that comes out of these wastewater treatment plants is what was supplying the whole bay. And now it seems to me um, that mm -hmm. it's, it's having some drastic effects in the mid to lower bay. And there is nitrogen you get from the ocean because you'll see it again. Once you, if you go down around Jamestown and look, if you drive down the west of the east side of Jamestown, north mm -hmm. of the bridges, it's hard to find a flake of, of uh, rockweed. And there's obviously there's no kelp that comes down through the bay anymore. Um, but all you have to do is go to the ocean side. You can stand in the parking lot at DEM at Fort Weatherall, look to the right side. If you're facing south, look in, look, there's a cove to the right. We call it skin, skin, skin Divers Cove. Look in there, it's full of rockweed. You look to the left side, and it's virtually no, no rockweed, the Narragansett Bay side. You know, so what's the difference other than a little spit of land, and this is the ocean, and this is Narragansett Bay. Hmm. Um, so there's, there's definitely some things taking place, and I absolutely believe that the nitrogen reduction was probably a good thing, but maybe not 50%.
think you know, it's too much. That, well, there could be you know some number in between. I think there needs to be some middle ground mm -hmm. so that um, you know we we do the best thing for Narragansett Bay as a whole, not just what happens in the Providence River. I mean, we don't spend our lives up in the Providence River, so I'm sure everything looks great up there for the folks that are up there every day. But mm -hmm. if you're down in the mid to lower bay, you say, you know, what happened to my bay? Yeah. Not the bay I grew up on. Yeah. Candace, um, I know the School of Oceanography does a weekly trawl, correct? Is that? Yes, they do. The Fox a Island and Whale Rock. Yeah. Trawl. And what has that shown uh, in terms of the changing species and the population? Well, the, the species have changed dramatically from a cold water bottom assemblage to a warm water summer migrant assemblage. So we have a lot of uh, fish moving into the bay in the summertime, uh, scup and butterfish, for example. Also, squid have increased a lot. Uh, so the biomass from the trawls, Lanny's right, we don't look at the menhaden with the trawls don't catch menhaden. The biomass has not changed very much. It's about the same. Mm -hmm. The biomass that changed was the big decrease in cancer crabs and uh, lobsters. They uh, they started leaving the bay in the late 90s, and th that was a huge biomass, a huge decrease. Uh, Do we know why? Well, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's complicated, yeah. <laughs> and there's lots of reasons. I mean, it could be the bay is too warm for, for lobsters now, and we're trying to do some experiments to figure it out. It could be there's greater predation on mm. lobsters in the bay now. I was a graduate assistant on the trawl in the early 60s, and it was cold water, and there were no lobsters in the bay at that time. Mm. So, you know, I, lobsters have increased and decreased in cold water and warm water. So it may not be temperature, it could be predation. We thought that when the cold water assemblage of fish moved out of the bay and lobsters and crabs increased, that it was the lack of predation from that community that caused the increase in lobsters and crabs. Mm. Uh, and now with all these summer migrants, and uh, including black sea bass, uh, it could be that the predation pressure on uh, cancer crabs and lobsters has hugely increased. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, I just want to say one thing about what Candy uh, said there. Um, the lobsters, I think there's a misnomer about the terminology being used. Mm -hmm. Candy said the lobsters left the bay. I don't believe they left the bay. They just disappeared from the bay. There's a difference, okay? And that could be for a number of reasons, you know, predation and so forth and loss of habitat. But the lobsters, <clears throat> they're still out front of Narragansett Bay on the ocean side in Rhode Island Sound. Like I said earlier when I do the ventless lo lobster trap study. So there's a big disconnect between the bay and the ocean. Those lobsters didn't leave from the upper bay and migrate out of the bay and they all live in the mouth of the bay now. That's not the case from a fisherman's perspective and our observations over the years. That's not what took place. There was a disappearance of the lobsters over a time period. And part of it has to do with habitat and water quality. So that's just my opinion. That's our perspective. Mm -hmm. And our observations over the years, I mean, th they can be quantified. There is very little rockweed and almost no kelp left in the bay mm -hmm. and very little uh, eelgrass also. And I'd just like to add to that, that doesn't explain quahogs. I mean, we talk about warm temperatures, change of different animals coming to the bay. I get all that. And like I said, I'm not a climate change denier by any means. But quahogs used to live throughout the whole bay. We had shellfishmen that worked from Dutch Harbor all the way up through the northern parts as far as they could go in Narragansett Bay. And those, those days are gone. So mm. that warm water doesn't explain that because, like I say, Quahogs live fine in Florida. Same exact species, mm -hmm. mercenary, mercenaria. Jonathan, if you can quickly just say what, in terms of Save the Bay, what have you seen in terms of the, the marine life, the ecosystem, and, and your observations of how it's changed? Well, I, I think um, uh, to, to echo Candace, it's complicated. And so to, to summarize in a few moments is tough. But, you know, I, I think what's clear to us is a changing composition in species. In recent years, we've seen a recovery in Manhattan populations, but that recovery is probably has as much to do with fishing pressure down the coast, particularly in Virginia. Uh, Manhattan are migratory fish. They uh, tend to congregate uh, offshore of Virginia and in Chesapeake Bay, and there's a large industrial fishery of Manhattan. And 
in fact, from the 70s through 10 years ago, even eight years ago, the men hid, hidden fishery had declined quite a bit uh, due to fishing pressure. And now that regulations are in place to help that recover, we've seen men hidden come back. They're here for plankton, and the stripers and the bluefish follow. All right. On that note, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank our panel once again for this very engaging conversation. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to also thank our studio audience for being here. We're going to conduct a question and answer session with the studio audience that we're going to post on the Rhode Island PBS YouTube channel for you at home to see. So the conversation will continue. And it's important to note that this program would not have been possible without the production support of Rhode Island Monthly and the Rhode Island Foundation as well. We hope it's a program that has enlightened you and maybe given you a better appreciation for a most valuable resource that belongs to all of us. For Rhode Island PBS, I'm Mario Flario. Thank you for watching this edition of Community Conversations. All right, we're going to continue our community conversation now. Is Narragansett Bay too clean with uh, questions from our audience for some of our panelists? Anyone have a question? we can start with. Okay, I'll bring you right over here. Uh, just give me your name. Um, hi, my name is Meredith Haas, and uh, my question is with regards to the treatment. There seems to be two issues, one with the amount of nitrogen being reduced and also with the toxicity. So with regards to the chemicals um, being used for treatment, is your concern that the toxicity tests that are being used aren't effective enough? Who wants to take the owl? Yeah, I'll take that one. Yeah, personally, I feel the toxicity tests that they're using are ineffective. Now, I know it's a standard set down by the EPA years and years ago, but uh, for Narragansett, every estuary is different and it's unique and it's what it's, it's makeup of its uh, algae and different types of marine species. And Narragansett Bay uses uh, mycids and the sex organs of sea urchins to do their toxicity test and it's done four times a year. And so from my perspective, uh, the mycids they're using are grown in a lab in a petri dish. They've never seen the light of day. And I've never seen a sea urchin in Narragansett Bay in my whole career, in over 40 years. Maybe there's some there, I've never seen them. So I'd like to see uh, some native species used for the toximity test. And I know there's arguments for and against it. And also four times a year, as far as I'm concerned, is nowhere nearly enough. And if I'm not mistaken, some of the wastewater treatment plants aren't required to do the toximity tests. They're voluntary, and sometimes they're not even done. But when you do it four times a year, you go out one day in four months and test the water quality for toximity, you know, for the life of the Narragansett Bay, that's not going to tell you anything. That can change from one day to the next. So I have a real issue with it. I think it needs to be readdressed and restructured. Tom. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I hope it did. Well, what I would say is the whole effluent toxicity testing is very expensive. And uh, so you, to do it more frequently than four times a year would be impractical if they're always in compliance. It's just a waste of money. The, the other thing is the, the standards, the toxicity testing, a lot of these standards were developed by EPA at the Atlantic Ecology Lab down in Narragansett. So a lot of the studies that have been done were done right on Narragansett Bay to begin with. <laughs> So I don't know all of the details about that, but I would say that the testing is very comprehensive. They test to see if species die, and there's also a list of about 126 priority pollutants, toxic chemicals that were known that you analyze for. So you analyze for those known toxic chemicals, but you're also analyzing the water itself to see if it kills these species. And then if it killed the species, then they could drill down further to see what is doing it, what's the problem. And I don't think it's people, sewage treatment plants have a choice. I'm pretty sure it's written into the permits of all the treatment plants that they have to do toxicity testing. Uh, Go uh, ahead, I'd just like to add, add, yeah, add a little bit to the, the idea. It's a toxicity test. Well, that tells you if it kills it, obviously, right? It doesn't tell you if it blinded it, if it made it sterile. I mean, there's so many different things that a small amount of chemicals could be doing to these animals that shows up further on down the line. Um, yeah, so Lanny, that's what the, uh, the sea urchin test is for. It's a reproduction test. So they do yeah. test it, you know, to see if it can reproduce, if it's still able to reproduce, mm -hmm. and they count the numbers of, you know, mm -hmm. that don't reproduce. So 
Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't address the reproductive system sort of out of fish species and I, I understand. And, I understand. It's a proxy. It's a proxy all, right. for different species. And the test is done over what a forty-eight hour period of half the animals. Uh, something like that. Yeah, yes. Half the animals, yep. half the mice don't die in forty-eight yep. hours. It considered. Are you sure you're not an environmental scientist? <laughs> you're pretty good at this stuff. <laughs> it's considered healthy for the marine environment. I just don't buy that. I mean, half yeah. of them are dead and it's still okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a real problem with those toxicity tests. I think they should be readdressed. And Tom, you know, I see your point. It's very expensive and everything. It's the health of Narragansett Bay, a marine estuary. Exactly. I mean, how exactly. much? Exactly. Well, just to give you a, just to give you an update when you want to talk about money, we spent 100 million dollars to rebuild Fields Point treatment plant, 66 million dollars to rebuild the Buckland Point treatment plant, then an additional 50. Two million, fifty-two point three million for nitrogen removal. Uh, we're spending one point three billion dollars for bacteria for the CSO project. We spent uh, about six hundred and fifty million already on phases one and two. Phase three is going to be about eight hundred and fifty million. So clean water is very, very expensive. So we don't take it lightly. We want to make sure when we're spending ratepayer money that the capital investment is going to result in sound water quality improvements and it's based on sound science so we we're with you guys and you know what i say to that all that money you spent would it would have been great if you converted fields point to uv that's all i can say <laughs> it all goes back to uv anyone else have a question from our audience yes hi i'm um, jennifer mccann uh candace can you tell talk a little bit about what happened this winter with the winter bloom and uh, and what you think may be happening because of that bloom? Well, I, I made the prediction in, a, in the, probably the Baird Symposium that the bloom was no more, that it was never going to occur again because the nutrients are too low in the winter time. And this year we had the most magnificent winter bloom of my entire career. Uh, we had uh, very high levels of chlorophyll and very high levels of primary production. And I attribute it to uh, runoff during uh, October. Re October was a rainy month, and then we had a major storm October 30th with five inches of rainfall, and that washed a whole bunch of nutrients into the bay. And uh, when the winter bloom began, or was ready to begin in uh, January, it got very cold all of a sudden. So that meant the grazers, the zooplankton, weren't in the water column or weren't active in the water column. So the bloom started, it had all those nutrients to work with from the runoff event, and uh, it was a superb winter spring bloom. <laughs> and from that, I think that the bay this year will be uh, productive in many other ways, that there'll be good sets of shellfish. Uh, and we've seen in some of the areas, Lanny's even confirming that the rockweed is growing well in some areas, so in the lower bay, I grant you. But uh, I think it's going to be a good good year for the bay. That's nice. We like to hear something positive. Anyone else have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Candace. I guess um, you just said that there was the big rainstorm, rain events that washed more nutrients into the bay, which increased the nitrogen. That's what caused this bloom. Yep. Correct, right? So. We're reducing everything 50 to 60 percent. I mean, shouldn't shouldn't we maybe back off on that number a little bit? Maybe go to 30 percent or something like. I don't know what the number would be, but it seems to me like we've over. It's too much of a reduction. Does that make any sense? Well, I, I don't know. I I have to say it's complex. Um, we don't have a lot of data yet for what the nutrient reduction has done compared to the data we have prior to the nutrient reduction. So there's, there's still time, we're still gathering data and trying to figure out what the total effects were. And we're, we're worried about uh, reductions in, in resource species like shellfish and fish. And, and so we're keeping a pretty close eye on things like that and trying to figure out why things like uh, lobsters may have disappeared from the bay. Um, but I think it's too soon to say the reduction is too much. It's, it's time for us to be looking at it very carefully and also listening to people like the fishermen and, and hearing what their observations are. We need a lot of input. Mark, Go ahead, Could I Jonathan. just add, I think it's a great question as well. And um, I think it's the, important to remember that runoff, rainfall, dr drives a lot of the nu nutrient pulses into the bay over time. 
In the last in the last <coughs> five years, we've had one really wet summer, but the other summers in the last out of the last five years have been quite dry. So this is where you need to study the impact of the you need to put in context the impact of the wastewater treatment plant reductions um, as compared with rainfall events. You need to look at the two combined over a long uh, time series to see how the two interplay. It's important to remember too that rainfall and runoff probably accounts for something like 25 to 30 percent of the loading and atmospheric deposition of nitrogen is another 10 to 15 percent. So there are other sources of nitrogen that come into the bay regularly, they just tend to be more episodic with rainfall, whereas the wastewater treatment plants are constantly discharging. What's, what's the top, go ahead, Lanny. Yeah, no, I'd just like to at least hope that this wasn't a one and done kind of event that took place this year, because I think timing is everything, like Candace said. We need that big rainfall event in October, and we need that cold temperature to kick in in December. If that doesn't happen, we could go another five, six, seven, eight years who knows how long before you have enough nitrogen so that the bay becomes productive again. That means shellfish suffer, that means everything suffers. That secondary production is what the entire fishing industry and even recreational fishermen, everybody that cares about the natural resources that are in Narragansett Bay and the habitat that they need, needs that nitrogen pop. We need that kelp, we need that rockweed. Without it, there's no place for these animals to hide from the predation. Maybe that's a big problem with predation. There's no place for the little critters to hide anymore because we lost the kelp, we lost the rockweed, we lost the eelgrass. So you can make all the babies you want, but if they don't have a place to hide, they're gonna get eaten up by all these visitors that we have coming to Narragansett Bay now, like sea bass and scup. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Veronica Baronsky. Um, this probably is a question maybe for Lenny and Al. So it seems like you're concerned about two things, the toxicity, and that's where you're talking about UV treatment, um, but you're also talking about nitrogen reduction. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think those are related. So I'm asking you, um, so what do you think are the, uh, which is your biggest concern about the Bay? Or are you concerned about both of those? Well, we're concerned about both of them. I think the two huge issues in the Bay for the health of the Bay and they are related because you're using the wastewater treatment plants to reduce the nitrogen. And uh, so they are, they are related to that respect, but that's two, two issues. And those are the two issues that we are trying to address. And we think they have a, a cumulative effect on the bay for the health of a marine resource. So that's why we're concerned about it. When we look at our observations, like Lanny said about the disappearance of the eelgrass, the kelp, the rockweed, the barnacles don't grow north of the bridge anymore. We lost the sea squirts, the grape. There's, there's something really taking place in the bay here. And yet when you look right out front, just down the East Passage, just a little bit, everything seems to be healthy. All those things are still growing. So there's a, I said this before, there's a big disconnect between the bay and the, and the mouth of the bay and the ocean. And it's all taking place, we feel, through the wastewater treatment plants. That's just our opinion. I mean, that's the only thing. I don't see other big changes in the bay with climate change or water temperature that would affect it that drastically that quick. That's just my opinion. Lanny? Yeah, and just further observations. I just saw pictures recently. There's a bunch of rockweed up in Bristol Harbor. Anywhere where there seems to be where there's adequate nitrogen, you have this growth. You have rockweed, kelp, things like that growing. You can go down to the salt ponds. Um, is the east side of uh, Salt Pond down towards Point Judith, you go up in the upper region, it's just loaded with rockweed. The way Narragansett Bay used to look, well, the mid to lower Narragansett Bay used to look, it's all but gone in those places. Mm. Um, same thing with eelgrass, you know. Do we have another question? Yes. <coughs> Mitch Petro, what determines the length of time that we're going to stick with this 50 to 80 percent nitrogen reduction? Um, I mean, it happened in 2003, the fish kill, and then we started to reduce nitrogen right after that. It's been 15 years since then. I guess, yeah, that's... I, w I was thinking that too, like what is an appropriate time, Candace, to, to study this and whether that reduction amount yeah. is adequate or was appropriate? A 30% reduction was achieved in 2005 the 50% uh, to 60% reduction was achieved in 2012. So it's been about six years. And we've had uh, 
one rainy summer, as Jonathan has indicated, and we have very high levels of low oxygen in the summer, dead zones in the upper bay. And since then, we've had uh, dry summers. Every year has been very dry, and the hypoxia has been very much reduced. But our concern is we haven't seen enough wet years yet to fully uh, understand what the effect of that nutrient reduction might be. So I, I guess I can't put a time limit on it. It has to be, when do we get to next rainy year? Jonathan. And also, I, I think it's just worth remembering that, that the bay remains very productive, but in different ways. And this gets the sort of question about how species are changing. The abundance of particular species are changing. The bay remains very productive, but the fish that we're observing or the crabs, the other aquatic life, are shifting and changing. And I think one of the things I think we all agree on around he, uh, this table is there are a lot of things we don't know the answers to. And we need to be sure that we're looking at some of these key questions about why uh, we're seeing effects that we wouldn't normally anticipate on particular species. Lobster is a great case in point. Um, so I think, I think there's clearly a need to, for more research so that we can make informed management decisions. That's what this is all about, making smart decisions based on sound science. And um, that's, I think, one of the greatest needs uh, going forward is to be sure we're putting money to research. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Yeah, Tom Doyle. This is for Tom there. We've reduced the uh, chlorine residual all, out, all throughout the bay, but in order to accomplish that, we're using the sodium bisulfite. And do we know the effects of the sodium bisulfite, and why don't we monitor that bisulfite when it goes into the bay? We, we have uh, certain limits that we're able to discharge, so we do, we do monitor what goes into the bay. You don't monitor the sodium bisulfite. We may not have a permit limit, but uh, we, we... I have 20 years' experience in a wastewater field, and chlorine is the only thing that we're worried about going into the Total bay Total residual this time. chlorine is monitored continuously. And so your bisulfite whether it takes five gallons to reduce the chlorine or it takes 10 gallons, I've noticed that basically you're dumping 20 gallons in to make sure there's no chlorine going in. I'm not sure that's, in. that's the case, Tom. I, I can check on that and get you, the, get you some data on that, but I'm, I'm not sure that's the case. In addition, we wouldn't want to be sp spending that kind of money to pour in 20 gallons extra of, of chemical that's not needed. These are, these are computer controlled systems they're highly sensitive. The chlorine limit for drinking water is four parts per billion. The chlorine limit for wastewater is 65 parts per billion. We discharge 2.5 parts per billion uh, in, of chlorine. How much is the bisulfate you discharge? And, the, and like I say, the bisulfite that we discharge is a thousand times lower. It converts to sulfates, and that's a thousand times lower than naturally occurring sulfates in seawater. And what effect does it have on the seawater? Well, as I, as I indicated, these standards are developed by the EPA. You know, we, our job is permit compliant, to be in compliance with the permit, not that to develop the better. standards. Oh, the, the but the EPA was develops these and they study them, and they're the folks that tell us, that assure us this is best available technology, and this is what you should be doing. DEM puts that into our permits, and that's kind of the way it works. So uh, I can't answer for EPA. But you raise a great question. I mean, these are, these are some of the things that I'd like to see studied because clearly something is going on. We've been adding chlorine bleach in Providence since 1912. Oh, yeah. And tons of it. And yep. overdosing all the time, I'm sure. But now we've Until there were standards that we had to meet. So now there are these standards, and we know we're meeting those. And so could, could bisulfite have some effect? That's a good question for the EPA. But they haven't studied something I'm like sure that. I'm sure they have. They're I don't think the EPA is going to tell us go ahead and add this without studying it, Tom. <coughs> so that's that's my thought. But it's well, and maybe it requires additional studies, and we we can try to get copies of their treatability studies and analysis on that. They let the chlorine go for all those years, though. Mm. Uh, well, keep in mind the DEM uh, wasn't around for for many years either. The Clean Water Act just started in 1972. And prior to that, we had a, we had a Department of Environmental uh, Services or something or other, Natural Resources. And it wasn't until the 70s uh, that we 
we formally had the DEM come around. So uh, regulation, environmental regulation is relatively new. Yeah. Yeah. Al, you yeah, wanted to? I've got a question for Tom. You're using sodium bisulfite to disinfect the chlorine, right? To break down the chlorine yeah, and use it up. for disinfection process. No, the disinfection process is the chlorine. So what you have is you have... Dechlorination process. For, for dechlorination. Okay. Yes. So when you combine the two chemicals together mm -hmm. and you mix it in a solution of salt water, yep. what are the byproducts? Chlorides and sulfates, two things that are natural in seawater, as I indicated. So you add, we add chlorine bleach to the wastewater, chlorine and water. It makes hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite ion. Then we add sodium bisulfite, and that breaks it down to, to sulfates. So it uses up that free chlorine and available chlorine, so it cannot oxidize organisms outside of our treatment plant. So that's the reason we do that, so it doesn't kill microorganisms. We don't want it to kill the plankton. We want it to kill the bacteria in the treatment plant. And that's what we want, that's why it's added. When I did some research, I found that you had the byproducts were heat, hypochloric acid, and sodium sulfate. So I did some more research, and what do they use sodium sulfate for? That's one of the byproducts that are going in Narragansett Bay. And they use it for cooking and preservatives and food and everything, but I found a real interesting use for it. They have these, uh, an infestation of crown of thorn starfish on the Great Barrier Reef, and they were trying to eradicate them. So they did all kinds of testing to eradicate these starfish because they're eating the coral on the Great Barrier Reef. And you know what they're using to eradicate those? Let me guess, sodium sulfate. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> That's exactly what they're using to kill those starfish. <clears throat> yeah. And so and my now, question would be of what concentrations well, and that, what that's, levels. That's the and, question, right, exactly. Yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is nobody yeah. knows the concentrations that this stuff ends up in the bay. And, you know, they said the starfish disappeared in the bay from, from a disease. How do we know it wasn't the sodium sulfate that killed off the starfish in the bay? And it might be killing off the rockweed and the kelp. Nobody knows all this stuff. These so to Jonathan's point, we, there needs to be some research done here and figure out why Narragansett Bay, and I disagree with what Jonathan said. He said it's very productive and vibrant and everything. That's not from my perspective. I don't see that. When I scoop up that bucket of water in the summertime and there's nothing in it, that's not a very productive bay in my opinion, okay? Mm -hmm. So something has to be done, and we all have to work together here. We can't oh, be yeah, enemies, we and we all have our opinions, but ours are coming from observations, and they aren't healthy observations for Narragansett Bay. So maybe Jonathan's right, you're right, we need to do some more research, but there's a lot of questions that need to be answered here, and I don't think they were ever researched fully enough you know, to be treating the, the wastewater the way we are, to be honest with you. When I look at the uh, research for the UV, and I know you've already made your argument, but UV, the whole world is going to UV. It's, it's a no-brainer in my... You could eliminate all those possibilities by switching to UV. And I just don't know why this day and age with Rhode Island wants to be the green state with wind farms, which shade of green are we in for Narragansett Bay? So we all have to work together here, and we're all looking for the same cause. We want a healthy marine ecosystem in Narragansett Bay. So I hope we can work together in the future Absolutely. and not block heads. We have to, we have to work together here. Lanny. I couldn't agree more. I mean, Rhode Island wants to be the green state. We're going to fill the ocean full of wind farms, um, all kinds of issues. And here we are in this day and age, we're still talking about dilution being the solution for pollution. All of this stuff is pollution. Every chemical you're putting in that bay is pollution. Everything that goes through that plant is pollution. And here we are dumping it into an estuary of national significance. Actually, I disagree with you, Lanny. We, we clean up the water. We clean up millions of gallons a day, billions of gallons for a day. For fecal coliform, yes, no, you do. No, for fecal coliform, mm. for solids, for bacteria, for nutrients, mm. for a number of things. And uh, the and amount of chemicals that are used. Things, a uh, whole host of things that go through the system that don't. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we've been doing is working mm -hmm. with Dr. Raina Lohman at URI, yeah, we know and he's that. studying mm. pollutants of emerging concern. Right. And these are some of the things that uh, we don't know much about mm. and we're learning about. And these are very, very low concentration chemicals that come, many of them from hospitals and pharmaceuticals and from other chemicals. There, there are things that they put on clothing today. There are things that they put in laundry detergent today, hand cleaners, hand sanitizers. And these things just pass through because you can't detect them. And Dr. Lohman's been working on methods 
to detect them. And we've been working with him to sample our wastewater in the influent and the effluent to, to track it, to see how much we can remove and how much is in Narragansett Bay. So we've been proactively evaluating that. And I think you're going to see a lot more research on that because it could be some other pollutant of concern that you don't even aware of. It could be you know, pharmaceuticals. It, it could be. It, it could, could be anything. And, it, but, and, and to your point, when we do look at UV, the, one of the other pros of it, it eliminates viruses. And the, mm -hmm. all the research I did for using the chemicals for the tea tree treatment, it doesn't eliminate viruses. Yeah, but they eliminate some viruses, but all viruses can pass through a treatment plant. But so UV uh, eliminates viruses. Some multiple, viruses, yes. Min, yeah, min, yeah. Many more yeah. than the chemicals does. And Maybe it's the UV causing this problem. You know what UV does? <laughs> it affects the uh, it affects the <laughs> DNA Buckland and the point? RNA Buckland of the Buckland bacteria, Buckland and the stuff right? just passes right through it to the uh, bay. Uh, that's, what Maybe. That, yeah. <laughs> that's your other plant, Buckland Point. Oh, yes, yeah. that's yeah. right. Gentlemen, that's gentlemen, right. We have another question from the audience. Hi, Ken Roberts. I'm wondering, as citizens of Rhode Island, is there anything that we can do to help out, such as trying to reduce the amount of water that we're using, or um, even on the political side, uh, to help keep the bay healthy. Thank you, Kenneth. Lana? Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, me and Al, like I said, we've been working on this for four or five years, and we keep hitting roadblocks at dead ends, it feels like. You don't really get anywhere. And we're hoping that some young group of people that were really concerned about their environment in Narragansett mm -hmm. Bay would get on the bandwagon and, and help carry the message, because we can do a better job. Jonathan? Um, I mean, these groups are trying to do a good job, but um, you know, to push people in the right direction. It wasn't that long ago we thought DDT was okay and Agent Orange and the list goes on and on and on. All these different chemicals that are in our environment now, PCBs. Well, some of these chemicals that they're using probably are going to be on those same lists at some point in our lifetime. It already is in Europe. They don't use chlorine for drinking water. They don't put it in their swimming pools. In this country, we're, we're still back a few years. So there's a whole, a whole host of different things, I think. Um, that we could be doing, and if we can get the young people behind it, um, put it on Facebook, it'll go places. Jonathan? I, I think it's a great question, too, and I, I, I really do appreciate the question. I think uh, there are really two or three ways all of us can do our part. Um, the first is how we live our lives, taking care of our own impacts on the environment uh, with a number of different partners uh, Save the Bay produced a little booklet uh, about a year and a half ago called Bay Friendly Living, which helps people understand things that they can do in their personal lives to protect the environment, protect the bay from bacteria, protect the bay from uh, fertilizer and, and uh, contaminants and chemicals running off your lawn into the bay. So I just think, you know, eliminating use of plastics, particularly, uh, you know, single-use plastics is really a big problem now in the Bay, and a growing problem is plastics in the ocean environment. So I think there's sort of personal responsibility thing, things you can do, and, and as you, uh, as we all kind of lead by our own example, I think we can help influence families, friends. I think that's really important. I think politically it's also important that we speak out and let our elected representatives know what we're concerned about, as these guys are doing. I mean, I think they're doing what they should be doing, which is signaling their concern for how we manage the Bay. And uh, management often takes money. So letting the, letting the governor, letting your state rep, your town uh, council know that investing in environmental protection is important. One, we talked about one of the big sources of pollution in Narragansett Bay today outside of the wastewater treatment world is polluted runoff. And that much of that falls to the responsibility of local towns. They have to do their part. And so it's up to us to call our mayor, call our town council, tell them it's important to deal with a problem of polluted runoff. They're required to by law, but often they don't seem to want to. And so we have to make them know that's important to us. We want to have a vibrant fishing industry. We want to have public access. I mean, our goal in life at Save the Bay is that you should be able to swim anywhere you want in Narragansett Bay, not in just certain areas, but everywhere. You should be able to fish anywhere you want in Narragansett Bay. So I think speaking up and making your voice be heard, it's amazing how you can amplify, you know, if you and I and all of us in this room, we can get people's attention if we speak up uh, and speak out. So. 
that those are the two basic things that I think we can all do. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much. Todd, I'm going to give you the final word. Your article brought us all together here, so I just want to give you the kind of the final word on your thoughts on just the, all the perspectives that we brought here together um, and, and your reflection on, on what you've heard. Uh, to be honest, I was frankly surprised that this that this one article really created such a such a huge response from from the public. Uh, glad that it brought us all together to continue the conversation. You know, everybody said it. It's complex, uh, tough to figure out what to do and and how to and how to do it. We need to uh, continue the the discussion of and and find some funding to, to continue some of the research to figure out the answers that need to be done. But uh, it's from this group right here. We've, we've sort of come together and, and uh, are at least getting to some agreements, uh, and that kind of partnership is really the, the, the first step we need to take. All right, Todd, thank you so much. Thank you again to the panel, to our studio audience. I think the one thing, the one constant, is that the Bay is always changing, right? So thank you for uh, continuing the community conversation with us, and thanks for joining us.